So I think it's a relatively rare thing. And so I thought I'd talk about it because it, it was quite interesting and something maybe to keep an eye out for. So I think there's probably an element of a misnomer here. I think historically in the literature, it was sort of called a thalmoplegic migraine. Um, and we were calling this a, it should really be called a sort of recurrent painful thalmoplegic neuropathy. And I think it's been described since the 19th century and it kind of runs in this sort of spectrum as we all know that's a bit inflammatory conditions affecting the apex, the fissure and, and the cranial nerves. So it's really rare. I think probably it would be evident from the, the, the lack of knowledge about it. Um, but we think probably most of the studies that have been done on it so it probably starts probably in adolescence and uh, with a slight female predominance. But the studies that have been on is it present right away. And this is a sort of often a recurrent condition that happens throughout life. The exact mechanism is unclear. So I assume as a, a reflection of the fact that there's not many cases. I, in my, my mind, it seems a, like an immediate mediated process. In quick suggestions about whether or not it compressive issues with um, you know, an ICA that's inflamed or a bit of viral connections or even a proposed mechanism with CGRP, but that sounded very tenuous and I wasn't really convinced and it wouldn't really explain the thalmoplegia aspects to it. So what are we looking for? Um, so features are unsurprisingly headache, classic thing blocked, either <laughs> orbital, retroorbital headache, and um, with sort of, often with migraines features in that you know photophobia, photophobia nausea, and there's often a, 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 a lateral thalmoplegia. Classically, a third, or the most commonly so, but it can be an isolated six, it can be a third and a six, but uh, an isolated fourth with this condition seems to be rare, and there's often not people involved in either. So classically, would evolve quite quickly, and then and then improve over days and, and weeks. And the most useful test. Obviously, you're thinking about the, a, a wide differential in that context, but the most useful test is MRI finding notes. And again, not much data. 30 to 40% of the patients, you would get a positive in the scan. And then contrast enhanced MRI scan, uh, it would show uh, an enhancement of the, the, the affected or the nerves. I think this is this is showing, a, a, this is from a paper that one of the few papers on it, then recently it is showing an enhancement of the, of the third nerves. So, what do we do about it? I suppose you guessed it's steroids with, with, with most things. Um, I, I think, um, again, there's varying opinions on how you approach it from a steroid point of view. Do you give a pulse of metal cred? Do you give oral steroids and, and taper? And I think you know, there's not really, a, again, an evidence base for that either. I think from my experience from the case that I was dealing with um, is that we kind of deal with what's in front of us. Is this just someone that's resolving themselves? You maybe do taper them quickly. If they're having ongoing issues, you might um, do it a bit longer. Um, there was some that people use migraine preventative treatment to help prevent it, but obviously if it's actually a migraine process, then how effective is that? And there's not really an evidence basis for that. And there's not really any sort of evidence for sort of long-standing immunotherapies. So people are sometimes left with some skew or, or, or problems and sometimes make benefit from either you know, you know, uh, prism or business surgery in, in, in dramatic circumstances. So yeah, I thought that's a little bit of a, something different.